Welcome to Swipe to Church. We're so glad you're here today. My name is Stephanie, and I'll be your host for this online worship experience. If this is your first time joining us, we have a gift for you. If you check in with us, we'll send you a Starbucks gift card, and your next coffee is on us. Today is week 11 of our sermon series on Moses. Pastor Jason will have a great message to share with us. Speaking of the message, we have sermon discussion questions online at switzer.church slash next. Here, you can follow along with the message as well as find other ways to connect. Next up is Corey with the announcements. He's gonna share with us what's happening here at Schweitzer. Hello, welcome to Schweitzer Church. I'm Corey Lucivo, pastor of discipleship. If you're new to Schweitzer and want to know more about us, one great way to do this is by attending our Next Steps Coffee with the Pastors on August 11th at 10 a.m. in the lounge. Stop by the Blue Booth to learn more. This week, the Schweitzer Choir will begin rehearsals on Wednesday, August 7th at 6.30 p.m. If you've been interested in joining the choir, this is the perfect opportunity to jump in. This Thursday, August 8th at 11.30 a.m., we'll hear from Care to Learn at our monthly second season lunch. Make sure and sign up today at the Blue Booth or online. As we head into the new school year, one of the ways we serve our community is by encouraging students, teachers, and families at Pittman Elementary. This fall, we are providing school supplies for every student in the school, as well as helping stock classrooms for the teachers. And we need your help to do this. Be sure to stop by the table in the Fellowship Center today to pick up a back to school shopping list, and then be sure to return those supplies by next Sunday, August 11th. Once again, thank you for being here. Now let's continue with worship. Thanks, Corey. If you're worshiping with us live, I invite you to join the chat, say hi to your friends, give us your insights, and if you're in need of prayer, hit that prayer button. Now, let's continue with worship.
As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to join me as we go to our Heavenly Father together. God, we want to give you thanks and praise for all that you are doing and all that allows us to worship together no matter where we are. We know that you are always with us and the people who might be struggling with health issues or financial issues or whatever the case may be, we know that you are a God who is with us always and we want to thank you for that. Let's pray the prayer that your son gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of offering, I'm excited to share with you something that just happened here at Schweitzer. Last week, our student ministry went on a mission trip to Camp Barnabas. This camp serves a community of people with special needs. It's been incredible to see God at work in the lives of our students through this incredible ministry. And it's because of your generosity that helped make ministries like this possible. As always, you can give your tithes and offerings at schweitzer.church slash give. And now, here's Pastor Jason with week 11 of our sermon series on Moses. Reading from Exodus 33, 12 to 23. One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so that I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is not your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded, Then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name Yahweh before you, for I will show, I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, Look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. The word of God for the people of God and the people of the world. Hello and welcome. I'm Jason, and today... 
As you may have noticed from our reading, we are continuing in the story of Moses. The story that we began way back on Memorial Day, we started in Exodus 1, and we're going to be hearing about Moses through Labor Day. Yet as we hear this story, and as we continue to unpack things that happen within the historical books of the Old Testament, we discover in many ways that the story of Moses doesn't really come to an end. Moses' life and influence continue to carry on into the New Testament and they carry on through history and into our own. Uh, We find Moses' story taking place in film and music and art in new expressions. The life and the story of Moses casts a long shadow. The story that we find out here, that we read here, is a story of Moses. It's a story of Israel. It's a story of us. It's a story of God. For in this revelation... God describes himself to all who have ears to hear and to listen. Along the way, we've noticed, we've pointed out that sometimes Moses' life can bring up practical elements that can speak to us in some very unique ways. Moses, to a degree, can serve as a mentor or a guide. As we take a look at this story today that we've heard, this part of the story, Moses can really serve to us as a guide, somebody who is a fantastic negotiator. Let me um, unpack this just for a minute. We need a little backstory to, to see Moses as a fantastic negotiator. When we pick up the story today, right before this, the story that happened that Pastor Spencer talked about last week, you'll notice that the Lord had led the Israelites out of the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. And at that mountain, the Lord took Moses up onto the mountain and he gave him an overview of the covenant that existed between himself and the people of Israel. And he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. While Moses was meeting with God, the rest of the people down below were getting restless. And they decided that they needed a physical expression of the God who had delivered them from the Egyptians and who was going to lead them forward. And so they created a golden calf. And the creation of the golden calf was an incredible contradiction of the second commandment to make no idols of what God might look like. This served up to be an epic kerfuffle. And the Lord finally said, look, I will send an angel before you to the promised land, but I'm not going to go. The people and Moses were grieved tremendously. And in their grief, they declined to leave the place where they were at. They may have had in their minds the story of their ancestor Jacob, who had all kinds of ups and downs in life. He had promises that were made, and then there were promises that were broken, And along the way, he had some unique encounters with God. And there was this one moment when he was making his way back into a place that he didn't know exactly what he was going to find, back into the promised land. And the night before he was to encounter his brother, the Lord came to him and he wrestled with the Lord. And the Lord um, put his hip out of joint. And the Lord said to, to Jacob in that place, he said, let me go. And Jacob said, no, I won't let you go until you bless me. Actually, Jacob had come to a place in his own life, in his own experience, that his life was really dependent upon every blessing that would come from the Lord. He couldn't live unless the Lord blessed him. So the Israelites, as they're in the camp, as they've heard the Lord say, I'll send an angel before you, but I won't go. They're thinking, they're being reminded of this story that exists in their own history, that unless the Lord go with us, there is not life. And so they waited, and they waited. And Moses took a tent, what would be called the the tent of meeting, and he put it outside of of the camp where they were all stationed. He put it outside, and day after day after day, Moses would rise, and he would go to the tent of meeting, and he would meet with God in that place. He would go to the tent to talk with God. And what we see here then in the text that's been read in this particular interaction is Moses serving as a negotiator. He comes before the Lord and he says, when will you go with us? When will you go with us? If they have moved, if they would have moved without the Lord going, they knew that it wouldn't have been good. If they would have gone back to Egypt without the Lord's presence, well, that was just out of the question the people and Moses were willing to wait. And they were willing to let Moses serve as an advocate to God on their behalf. 
They knew that apart from God's presence, the promised land would be totally insignificant. And so Moses goes before the Lord and he pleads. What is it that makes Moses an expert negotiator? I'd like to suggest six things. Moses stays in conversation with God. Every day he seems to go to this tent of meeting, seeking to hear what God has to say and being revealed to God himself. Moses stays in conversation with God. He also, the second thing he does is he deflects easy solutions. One of the interesting storylines throughout the book of Exodus is that there are times when the Israelite people don't live up to what God's asked them to live up to. And God will make this interesting offer to them. He'll say to, to Moses, he'll say, Moses, how about I make a new covenant with you and we'll just leave the Israelites aside. In all reality, it's really a test to Moses' character because Moses is beginning to see that if the Israelites, the people of promise, can't live up to the promise, how would a new people out of his own line fully live up to the promise? It seems like an easy solution. It seems like he could just say yes if he left the Israelites behind. But he says, no, we've all got to go. The third thing that makes Moses an expert negotiator is that he weighs out the must-haves from the want-to-haves. One of the things that the Lord makes, again, is maybe an easy solution. Like he says, you can go to the promised land and my angel will go with you. Moses understands that if we're going to go to the promised land and there's going to be life, the Lord must go with us. And Moses appeals to God's nature, what he knows about God. One of the interesting things in verses 15 and 16, Moses repeats the words that he's heard from God. He repeats those back to God. He says, you've called me blessed and you find, you find favor with me. Well, I'm going to appeal to those things and ask you to move and to be with us on our behalf. The fifth thing that Moses does is he appeals to God's reputation. Not only does he appeal to what God has said, but then he says, if you don't go with us, what are the other nations going to say? If you, if you don't show up, what will other people think? And finally, the last thing that Moses does is he's bold. He knows what the must-haves are. They must have the presence of the Lord with them. But Moses also takes a flyer. He takes a leap. He says, you know what we'd really like, what I'd really like is to see your glory. I'd like to see all of you, God, just as you talk about seeing me and knowing me. I want to see all of you. These steps these six steps that Moses takes, they'd make for a great, we could extrapolate those and they'd make for a great seminar on the art of negotiation. And so they're useful to us in some form or, or measure. Actually, seeing these steps of Moses reminded me of a, of a young person years ago here at Schweitzer. We had a summer job that was open and we asked a young person if they'd be interested in the summer job. After a couple of days, the young person came back with a list of conditions. That was a bold move. It was something I did not expect. It was a list of conditions. They listed on their list several things that they desired. They noted what days they needed off. They were, they were unavailable for work. They noted their required compensation package. They noted how many hours they were willing to work and not any more. They noted that if somebody else could be hired, that they had a guaranteed spot for the summer. This young person knew their must-haves, their wants, and they were able to be bold and to communicate clearly. It was a stunning, bold, and skillful move. The young person knew the kind of people she was talking to. It was a bold move. For Moses and the young person and others in our midst, there is um, something more than a skill set that is picked up here or more than a skill that's being reflected in who Moses was or the young person was. In true reality, what is being revealed is the shape of a soul, of a particular kind of person. And Moses especially reflects in the request that he makes to God, he reflects the value of a selfless kind of leader. And he reflects the, that his soul has been shaped, not so much by the 
experience and the, and the back and forth he's had with the people, but by the back and forth he's had with God himself. He's willing to say to God, these people that you, you've, you've come to a place where you don't like some of the things they're doing, they are your people. He's arguing with God on behalf of the people themselves. They're not Moses' people, but they're God's people. And God, in his true nature, fully, dearly loves them. And so, Moses says, if we're going to go, you need to go with us. Moses is a great negotiator because he's picked up on the character of God and he's coming back to God with who God is and he's willing to talk to God face to face. Well, Moses' story is a story that not only points to his own transformation, but it points to what God is up to and it points to the person of Jesus. Because throughout this journey that Moses has been on, the people have become convinced and Moses has become convinced that there really is no life that's worth living without God. There's no future without God. It wasn't enough for them to have the blessings of God or to have God's Ten Commandments or to have God's promise of of a land that they could go to that they could call their own know what they really needed and wanted. What made life worth living was God himself. The Israelites and Moses, they sound very much like the disciples in John 6, as Jesus has said some very uncomfortable things about him being the bread of life. And people all around who hear it become uncomfortable and they begin to head for the exits. Jesus asked them, what about you? You've heard some things that may have rattled your understanding of me, but are you going to leave? Are you going to exit? John tells us that Simon Peter in that moment replied, Lord, to whom should we go? For you have given us the words of eternal life. Moses, getting God to agree to go, then makes a bold ask. Not only do you have the words of life, but you are life. Show me your glory. John Goldingay, in a commentary on Exodus, will summarize a historical teaching about God's response to Moses in that moment. That Moses, you have a great request, but it's unrealistic. For if you looked fully at my glory, it would be like looking into the sun. It would blind you or... Uh, actually, most of Christian history says Moses would be undone. He would, he would die. But God, in hearing Moses' request, gives Moses the closest approximate experience without putting him in danger. He says, I will pass by and I will proclaim my goodness and my grace, my compassion. You will see me as much as you can see me and take it in. Moses' ambition in this moment to see God's glory, to see God's face, to know God as God knows Moses will be a a passion that will bubble up in the hearts of people who really know God. And it will percolate when Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room, when Philip will say to him, Lord, you have talked to us much about the Father, but show us the Father and then we'll be satisfied. Jesus will reply, Philip, anyone who has seen me has indeed seen the Father. The people of Israel and Moses and the disciples, they love the conversation. They know that the Lord is the Lord of life. And they know that deep down, the deepest of their human hungers will only be satisfied as they see and know the Lord himself. And so they say, show us your glory, Lord. There are moments in our life when we're like, Lord, show us your glory. And there's a unique word that keeps coming to us from Scripture back and forth time and time and time again. If you want to really see the Lord's glory, if you want to see what we can partake of of the Lord's glory, look to Jesus. And Jesus will even take bread and wine. He'll say, when you take these things, it'll help you see me. Jesus will say, when you attend to the little children whom I love deeply, the little children that are in your midst, you'll help, uh, those little children will help you see me. 
And Jesus will tell us that when we care for people that he cares for, we'll get a glimpse of him. See, all of us, all of us need to see God's glory. And if we hear what Jesus says, if we read what Jesus tells us, if we attend to the things that Jesus um, values in everyday life, one of the things that Jesus says is, you'll get a glimpse of my glory. Um, we long for a lot of things, but the thing that Jesus longs for is to pass by us, to show us his glory to speak of his goodness, his grace, his compassion, so that ultimately the place deep within where our lives long to see the one who is life, Jesus longs to come to us, show us himself, and lead us in the ways of life. This is the gift he brings to Moses and the Israelites. It's the gift he brings to us if we have ears to hear and eyes to see, hearts open to receive. Kind Father, this day, we pray for, for us, for our own lives, for your church. We pray for the people in our community that you would help us see your goodness, your kindness, your grace, your compassion. Ultimately, help us to see your glory that's in our midst and help us to see that apart from you, there is no life. Bring us your life, we pray, and your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. I'd like to thank everyone who helped make this possible, especially Pastor Jason for giving us a great message. And if you know anyone who would benefit from this message, please like, share, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for doing that. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time for week 12 on our sermon series on Moses. Have a great week and God bless. Death came to life
bright crimson rose draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a casket the children are singing and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in blue pushed up from Scarlet sins had the crimson cost You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was a